Good afternoon, one and all, and welcome to this webinar on rebuilding trust in the public sector, framing the future for the ethical delivery of public services. Um, we are uh, very ex excited and delighted to have you on board. And uh, we have many people who have joined us from different parts of the world. So um, I want to, first of all, just introduce myself. I'm Christine Tokar. I'm with Dodds Training. And um, we uh, put together bespoke training solutions and consulting and coaching services for people from around the world, uh, mainly governments and, um, and other institutions. And I want to introduce you to, um, to today's speakers who are partners with Dodds, and they are Neil McC McCallum and Tanya Karlbach, who are with Yanoia Limited. And um, they, between the two of them, they have over 50 years of experience um, working around the world with public servants, with politicians, uh, the judiciary, civil society on a range of um, on a range of topics, including ethics, anti-corruption, good governance, and um, and supporting uh, good practice implementation in those sectors. So, for today, uh, we really would like your participation and we welcome your questions and comments and if you would um, use the hand function if you have a question and uh, if you don't want to be vocal you can also put your question or comments in the chat box We'd really like to know from where you, uh, when you have a question or a comment, uh, if you could just say what your name is and what country you're from or department you work with, uh, that makes it interesting for all of us. So um, I will now pass it over to Neil McCall McCallum, who will uh, begin the session and uh, take it away, Neil. Thank you very much indeed, Christine. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, with Dodds Training doing this and with all of you who've joined from around the world. Thank you very much indeed for being with us. Um, we uh, have a number of questions and thoughts that we want to share with you, um, but we want to particularly engage with you in a conversation. Um, we have sort of subtitled this event uh, back to the future or a brave new world we've done that because we wonder whether the most effective way of rebuilding trust in the public sector is to return to a set of principles that um, have been in place for some time uh, or whether we need to recognize that we're in a very very different place now uh, and we need to identify new structures, codes, um, and maybe even values as well uh, to rebuild trust. Obviously, um, we believe um, that there is a need to rebuild it, uh, and that suggests that we think there is a problem at the moment uh, with trust in the public sector, and we'll be talking about how that's come about what that means uh, and why it matters and most importantly perhaps what can be done about it um tanya if we could just move to the next slide please thank you very much so this is our agenda um we're going to talk very briefly about what public trust is and why it matters uh and then to think about how it can be eroded uh, and to suggest to you a checklist for rebuilding that trust uh, and then end with um, discussion, questions and answers. Now, at any point 
please do ask your questions um, and we will pause um, at various stages and address any questions that have come in at that point uh, because we hope this is a discussion um, not a, a merely a one-way lecture. There have been around for several decades now statements of public sector values and the um, OECD um, looked a few years ago at what the most common were across something like 40 different um, governments and nations uh, and there is perhaps not surprisingly a remarkable consistency uh, in what those are and the most common uh, that can be found in various countries are these. So the first thing the public sector needs to be is impartial. It needs to be politically and, and uh, in business-wise as well, neutral, uh, and it needs to make its decisions objectively. It obviously needs to act within the law and with respect for the rule of law. There's an expectation that public servants will act with integrity and honesty, that they will act with transparency and openness when appropriate and legal about why and how decisions have been made uh, and what alternatives were considered, etc. Uh, there's an expectation that public servants will act with uh, responsibility and be ready to be held accountable for the exercise of that responsibility. There is also an expectation that decisions will be made with a view to justice and fairness, um, without fear or favour to particular groups. Um, and it should almost go without saying, but it is worth saying, there is also an expectation that public services will always be efficient. The delivery of service is, after all, the whole point. Uh, and the way that it's delivered uh, has to garner trust and uh, support. But if we think about where have these come from? Are these, you know, have these values been around for a long time? And what is public trust anyway? Then it's probably worth uh, for a number of reasons, looking at what happened in the UK back in the 1990s. Not just because uh, it is an interesting case study, but because the values and the processes um, that led to the creation of um, the seven principles of public life um, have been reflected and echoed through various good governance and structural adjustment programs and the like funded by um, donors, um, multilateral and unilateral donors. Uh, and these again, rather like those that I described from the OECD, we can see uh, reflected and echoed in many, many countries. Um, the uh, august body of people standing uh, there, are the Nolan Committee um, and their chairman, Lord Nolan, a retired uh, judge, uh, is holding their report. Uh, and it is just worth reflecting on um, that group of people. And uh, excellent though every one of them uh, was, because um, I don't think any of them are still with us, um, in public life and no doubt in their private lives as well. They come from a narrow section of the population of a relatively small country. Uh, they are most certainly not a diverse group of people. And that raises the question about whether what these values um, that they propounded um, actually represent are really um, universal values or the values as perceived by a narrow uh, and favoured part of a 
you know, wealthy country. The values um, which they identified, which have remained in place now for over 25 years in the UK and are reflected in literally millions of contracts of employment for anyone working as a public servant, either in central or local government, um, in uh, parastatals, in uh, quasi-governmental organizations, universities, uh, the BBC, bodies like the National Health Service. But these have remained in place, not been added to, not been subtracted from uh, for a very long time. And that is an impressive thing. Uh, and if we look at the kind of things we're talking about, then they are very similar to the values that I've said the OECD identified across many countries. Accountability, selflessness, integrity, objectivity, openness, honesty, and leadership are the values. Now, um, not only were these created by you know, a, a group of elderly people a long time ago, but they were created in a very different world. Um, this is before social media, before 24-hour news, before a whole range of things which we now take for granted. Uh, and we need to ask whether the changes in society, in technology, uh, and in uh, citizens and individuals' expectations uh, undermine or require a change to those values. Uh, why does any of this matter? Well, it matters because if the public sector is not seen as a demonstrating values like those, then a whole lot of consequences flow from that. Um, the rule of law in general is undermined. If the public sector is seen to be corrupt, ineffective, um, riddled with favoritism uh, and sectarianism, say, then people will not obey the law in the same way as if there is some confidence and trust in the, the people who are both making the law and implementing the law there will be a dramatic reduction in compliance. Um, revenue generation will be affected. Uh, there is a clear correlation between tax compliance rates uh, and confidence in the capacity and appropriacy of government use of the tax that is raised. Um, so people will avoid paying taxes, basically. Uh, even more if they believe that the government to whom they're paying tax is either incompetent or corrupt or um, the money will just be stolen by somebody else. This also affects the inward investment into the country and the extent to which the country is seen as um, a safe place for um, business to invest, whether there's a confidence in the judiciary resolving disputes um, with integrity, honesty, and impartiality, uh, or whether judges can be bought, whether licenses uh, can be purchased, um, whether standards can be undermined. There is linked to that um, an issue about the country's international reputation. And there's perhaps a underlying all of this, something about the standards of behavior that people adopt. Um, if people, citizens, see that uh, public servants uh, at various levels are, even let's take fairly trivial examples about, you know, leaving work early, um, coming in, putting a jacket on the back of a chair and going off and driving a taxi for the day. Um, this becomes a statement of these things being, if not right, at least tolerable and 
the standard of behavior in society in many ways is set by the standards of behavior in the public service. So it matters for all of these reasons. And I'm hoping that um, before I just hand over and invite Tanya to take us to the next steps uh, on this, that we can explore whether uh, we do need a new set of values, and if so, why and, and what they should be, but also whether this is as serious as we think it is in your view. So we're looking forward to a discussion about that. And could I just say, have we got any um, points anyone would like to raise before I hand over to Tanya? Let me have a quick look. I don't see anything in the chat box. Uh, May or Christine, are there any questions anyone want to raise at this stage? No questions, yeah. Okay, right. Well, we will have a fair time for questions at the end, and I look forward to returning to this discussion. But at this point, I'll, I'll just pass over to Tanya to take us to the next step. Thank you very much, Tanya. Thanks, Neil. That's great. Oops, I'm now, there we go. Right, uh, as Neil mentioned, one of the issues that we're looking at currently is an erosion of public trust. And I'm going to draw a little bit on experiences that have been happening in the UK, because that's what I'm most familiar with. But I'm fairly confident that over the last 12 months around the world, everyone has experienced some level of decrease in public trust. And there's a number of reasons that this can happen, uh, regardless of whether or not we're in the middle of a pandemic. Uh, a, a typical reason is often a perception that there is a difference between the political class and the rest of us, uh, uh, us and them. And I put in an image here of pints of milk, because this is the standard test used in the UK to distinguish between a normal person and a politician. A normal person knows how much a pint of milk costs. A politician usually doesn't. Now, that's a huge generalization. It actually doesn't matter whether or not that's true. That's what people believe. And as we know, perceptions are very powerful in terms of creating trust. If you don't think that the people who have been elected to represent you understand you, then you're less likely to trust and adhere to the policies and guidelines that they are interested in. In the UK, in the last year, there has been an increase of what's called here chumocracy. And really what that is, is just nepotism. It is, my friends get better access to contracts, my friends get less uh, regulations applied to them, Great examples in the UK are the former special advisor to the Prime Minister, Dominic Cummings, who, when we were all under very severe, strict lockdowns, not supposed to leave the house at all, drove round trip over 200 miles because you know, he thought that was the right thing to do for his child. Now, during the same time period, many other people were actually not seeing parents that were dying, were unable to seek out care for other reasons. So this caused a huge scandal in the UK. The chumocracy, the handshake there, is really about how procurement has happened. And this is a global issue whereby the normal rules in place to protect public procurement have been circumvented somewhat for perfectly legitimate reasons in that we needed to move quickly to acquire things like the PPE to protect uh, in hospitals and so forth. Unfortunately, that has opened up an opportunity to provide privileged access to friends of politicians rather than privileged access to necessarily extremely qualified uh, tenderers. So again, uh, there's currently court cases where, in fact, civil society in the UK is taking the government to court for a lack of transparency about these contracts and questioning the validity of the contracts being let themselves. So why was the former pub owner, who is a constituent of the Minister of Health, why did he receive you know, a billion pound contract when he has no previous experience in PPE or in logistics supply? 
So a lot of interesting questions around that. You can imagine watching billions of dollars, uh, sorry, billions of pounds being diverted, causing a lack of faith in our government. The lack of transparency is an ongoing, regardless of whether or not you're in a crisis phase, we default to a certain level of cynicism. We believe that it is more likely that people are doing the wrong thing than the right thing if we don't know what that thing is. So the more that you can tell people what's happening, the more likely it is that they're going to trust you. They may disagree with what's happening, but they're not believing that secret decisions are being made and that the reason that those things are secret is because they're nefarious. And that's a really important thing. We rarely think that secrets are good things. We tend to believe that the reason something's kept secret is because there's something wrong with it. So if you have a tendency to openness and transparency, then you have a tendency to increase public trust. The more that you have secret decision-making, the more that you have an erosion of that. Neil mentioned the OECD focus uh, on efficiency. And in fact, uh, globally, the increase in mistrust in government is often linked to ineffective services. And this is simply because why should you trust a government that doesn't do what it says it's going to do? If it takes you months and months and months to be able to schedule an appointment with your local GP, or if you cannot claim a rebate from your tax, all of these things make you seem like less willing to trust the people who are operating it. If they can't do their basic job, why should you why should you give them their, your respect and trust? The other challenge within effective services is that it often encourages people to do perhaps I'm trying to think of a nice way of saying this. Basically, ineffective services lead to bribes. <laughs> if you can't get a service through the reasonable uh, authorized means, you can almost always rely on informal networks to be able to access it. And so that basically creates an environment within which corruption is more likely to take place. And it's not necessarily because it's a, you know, people want to be corrupt, they just want to get the service. So that's one of the huge reasons that there is a decrease in public trust. And many governments have been very successful in improving the perception of corruption by improving efficiency of services. So there may in fact not be a huge decrease in corruption, but there is a certainly an increase in public's belief that they are less corrupt. The other huge challenge to public trust is the one that we've seen most in the last year, which is an inability to respond to changing situations. So the most uh, open, transparent, ethical government fails in a moment of crisis. And so the person with the enormous piles of toilet paper, this may or may not have been familiar to all of you, but certainly in many countries, there was hoarding at the beginning of the COVID pandemic where people thought that actually society was going to collapse and we weren't going to have supply chains and their basic necessities would disappear. And one of those things was toilet paper. So, we'd reached the point where very few of us believed that our government was in a position to see us through. And so our response was to default to an individual action rather than to a societal collective action for the, the good of everyone. So I don't know if at this point anyone has any examples from their own jurisdictions that they would like to raise, but we can come back to this because I think this is one of the things that's been most interesting this year is that people who perhaps never have been inclined to look at issues of public trust or corruption are all of a sudden incredibly aware of how this is impacting our day-to-day -day life. So this is a, an example of really how the OECD for, um, looks at breaking down these issues of integrity in public life. And the reason I like this is because it looks not just at the value approach, which is often the way that we perceive things. When we talk to people about corruption, often people's first response is, well, if I'm a moral person, I'm not going to do anything wrong. 
uh, I have integrity, so because I am a religious person, I'm a good person who helps out my family and so forth. And in fact, there's more than just a value belief in the issue of integrity. The other is actually about competence, and that comes down to the efficiency and effectiveness of the services that we talked about. So essentially, you know, governments have things that they say they are going to do for citizens and they also have values by which they will deliver those services and the key things when we look at competence are the responsiveness and the reliability so reliability in a steady state you know, can we trust the government to do what it says it's going to do and usually we may be pretty pretty confident about that uh, they may be less efficient in some cases and so forth, but we, we think of them as mostly reliable. Responsiveness is the one that often comes uh, under attack in moments of crisis and difficulty. And the values are the areas that Neil mentioned previously, issues around openness, inclusiveness, fairness, that there is no difference between myself and this person, and that we are all treated equal before the law, that everyone has the same interests at heart, which are the interests of the society rather than the interests of the individual. This uh, diagram is part of a more general work that the OECD has been doing on public trust and integrity, and I definitely recommend you looking up. There's a lot of really useful resources available there, and I'm happy to spend a little bit more time talking about um, tools that they might be useful for you in your own jurisdictions going forward. If we're at the situation where we know that we have eroded public trust, which certainly in the UK, uh, I would say that the levels of public trust are lower in the last 12 months than they have been probably in the last 50 years. It's not a situation that helps anybody. How do we go forward? There's no point in just saying, well, it's terrible and that's it and we're just you know we need to have an election even an election even a new government's not going to change it this is about the institutions not just about political parties and there's lots of different things that you can do to address it what i've done here is just indicate the things that i would consider if i were looking at how you move forward and the first thing i think is actually knowing what the problem is and some people have talked about corruption as a cancer. And that's a very vivid description, but it's actually quite helpful as well. And one of the reasons it's helpful is because there are hundreds of different types of cancers and how you deal with them are different. Right? You don't treat lung cancer the same as you would treat bone cancer potentially. You don't treat uh, the same pa uh, different patients in the same way. And the same is true with corruption. You have to know what type of corruption, what type of challenge to integrity exists within your jurisdiction to be able to address it properly. And one of the, the problems in this sphere generally is that people tend to default to simple solutions of, well, we need, a legis we need new legislation, or we need to have an anti-corruption court, or we need to issue new codes of conduct. And those may all be extremely useful things, but unless you are solving a problem that everybody agrees upon, you're just doing a lot of work that actually is glossing over the issue. So one of the things that I'm a firm believer in and Neil supports as well is actually working with a larger group to identify what those problems are. So it's not just what do public servants think, it's what do civil society what are their concerns and issues? What are supranational groups? What is the business community's concerns and issues? And if you can spend time working with people to identify, is it the fact that I don't like having to pay a bribe to the police officer as I drive down the street? Or is it the fact that millions of government funds are being diverted uh, into kickback schemes? Different problems and different solutions because of that. Once you know what the problems are, and there will be more than one, it's very rare to have only one integrity issue or one public trust concern, there'll be different priorities. And within those, then you look 
for the specific solutions to address those problems. So this is just like the cancer again. Is it radiation? Is it chemotherapy? Is it a combination of both? Do you have to do surgery to remove the tumor? It's, you know, who knows? Once you know the issue, you design your treatment, and then you make a very strong strategic yeah, commitment to that. You make this part of a broader rebuilding, right? You want to be a cohesive society at the end of it. You want to have an environment whereby the public trusts the government and the government can trust that the public will adhere to the rule of law. Part of the strategic framework has to be a clear definition of responsibilities. And those responsibilities are both for public servants, for political leaders, for individual citizens, both in terms of developing a enhanced public integrity framework, but also in terms of keeping it going once it's in place. Lots of, uh, there are lots of examples of really ambitious transformation projects which don't actually deliver because you know on paper they existed but nobody bothered to do follow up on that so checking in making sure that actually the problem is still a problem or the problem's been fixed or the problem's evolved and therefore your solutions need to evolve so ongoing engagement not just once off we are going to do this and we did it the other is effective communication. And um, you know, this is true for pretty much anything that you do, but particularly when the issue is around trust. You can be incredibly, uh, have a very, sorry, you can have very high levels of integrity. You can have very, very strong standards in place, people adhering to those standards. But if you're not telling people what you're doing, if you're not showing and demonstrating what's happening, people will default to cynicism. And so, again, it's really important to be able to demonstrate that you're achieving what you set out to do. And I would say that you're looking to live the values that you actually say you want. And a good example of this that just happened recently was in the United States, where um, shortly after President Joe Biden came into office, he issued, um, I believe, a formal reprimand and put one of his staffers on leave for breaching you know, the ethical standards that he thought were appropriate for his staff. He said there was going to be a change, he made the change, and he held people to account for the change. So if something happens and you don't do anything about it, it's worse than not having said that this is what you were trying to achieve. So the difference between Joe Biden uh, reprimanding staff and putting them on leave, I think mean, leave or whether suspended, I can't remember, versus Prime Minister Boris Johnson um, making no difference to his personal advisor who had actually broken regulations. So trust levels, you can see, will go completely different on those two things. And just um, to, to add to these sort of things to consider when you're looking at going forward, the biggest challenge to people's engagement isn't actually fear, it isn't the unwillingness to work with government, it is cynicism. And so when you, they've done studies looking at whistleblowers, most people who have identified wrongdoing and chosen not to say anything about it, haven't done that because they were worried about the repercussions, they haven't said anything because they didn't think it would make a difference. So that marginalized group is just getting bigger and bigger. More and more of us are feeling marginalized because of the lack of trust. Right, so those are the, the key things that I would think about. And I would now be interested if anyone has any specific examples of erosion of public trust or actually successful examples of how you've managed to address that and perhaps change the, the trend from erosion to increase in trust. Thanks, Tanya. Um, a few questions have come in, so I'll just go ahead and read them out. So um, one person said that the seven principles of public life are indeed universal values and as such valid independently of the circumstances we are living in. Instead of changing those, should we not think about measures to make sure that they are respected? Are we too tolerant towards people not respecting those values? 
So if you could please answer that. Um, sure. I, Neil, I'm not sure if you want to say anything, but my, my quick response to that is, yeah, I think that you are right, that the, the values tend to be fairly universal. It goes back to this issue of actionable. Uh, we all have aspirations, but we very rarely, not very rarely, we're not as good at following up and holding people to account. And it's very disheartening to there. I'm sure there's examples in your countries as well, where there have been cases uh, where you've tried to hold people to account for large scale um, embezzlement or bribery fraud funds. And if it's not successful, then the next time around, people aren't going to be so engaged. It's also a challenge because governments aren't all, it, it's not very interesting, it's not sexy to fund uh, regulatory and enforcement agencies for things that relate to public trust. Uh, it's never very glamorous, but in fact, you know, there's no point in having the aspiration if there's no way of measuring and enforcing that actually those values are in place. I don't know, Neil, if you wanted to, to say anything to that. Uh, yeah, well, I completely agree with what you've said, uh, Tanya, and I think uh, I agree with um, the questioner that these are universal, but that that in itself can be a problem because, you know, words like integrity, honesty, um, can be interpreted in different ways, not only between one society and another, but even between one person and another. I mean, classically, um, other people take bribes, I have perks of my job. Um, you know, uh, we, we externalize the problem very often. So I think whilst the values are universal, exactly as you say, it does no harm for them to be stated and contextualized. And one of the positive things about the seven uh, standards, the seven values, are there is only seven of them. You know, it, it's not that hard to remember them, uh, but it's important that organizations explain what those mean in um, a particular context. And uh, we think we know how people should behave, um, but this will vary from place to place and perfectly justifiably. Uh, and I could give you an example of several years ago, a European agency. Um, had law enforcement people from member states working together uh, and they found that there's some serious differences in what law enforcement officers can do in different countries and you couldn't assume that simply because they were all law enforcement officers they would all work in the same way um, and this is not about you know who's good and who's bad it's simply about what you're allowed to do at home um, and what you're allowed to do within the international organization. And the international organization had to just go through a process of defining a set of values because they couldn't assume, as they had before, that, well, it doesn't matter, does it? You know, as long as everyone works the way they do at home, it will be OK, because there will be differences. So stating the values and contextualizing them, not only in terms of the place, but also in terms of the time and the situation, as I mentioned, there is an interesting thing around how the seven principles were created before things like social media um, became the, the force that it is, um, before the, the expectations of citizens changed. So what, ha what they actually mean in, for today uh, is, is a key thing, I think. Thank you very much. Thanks, Neil. Thanks both. Um, so we have another um, person who said, so not a question, but in the Caribbean, even though we, we practice the same British system, there is a lack of separation of powers and as such, the entire system is muddy. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to uh, let somebody from Scotland answer that. <laughs> yeah, I think um, I don't really know what to say to that other than yes, it's really difficult and even to be fair in many jurisdictions where you may actually have a clear distinction between the powers, you there's a, a difference between those powers actually being utilized and not. Uh, so there are many Eastern European countries, for example, where technically the judiciary is independent, but in reality, uh, 
where they are in terms of how they engage uh, with informal networks has meant that in fact they are not. So on paper, yes, but in practice, uh, informal networks still reign over how those judgments get made and so forth. And my, my rather childish comment about Scotland is because there is precisely this issue going on in, in the Scottish Parliament and an inquiry uh, about the extent to which separation of powers has or has not been effectively uh, followed in recent years. And the smaller a jurisdiction uh, and a nation is, the harder that is. Um, and I'm very well aware that um, in a number of small island states, for example, uh, it's, a, it's so difficult. You know, how are you going to have are you going to have a jury of 12 people, none of whom know the prosecutor, the defending lawyer, the accused person, the judge, or any of the witnesses? That is just physically impossible. How are you going to achieve um, appointment boards, interview panels, where nobody knows uh, or is not related to any of the candidates? So this, again, it comes down to contextualization. And unfortunately, sometimes it is easy for larger, well-resourced environments to be a bit preachy about um, separation of powers and such things, when it is not a case of whether or not people believe in that concept, but whether or not that is physically and, and, and logistically possible in the environment concerned. Thank you. No. The one thing I would say about that, Neil, that's actually kind of interesting is that with small island states and other small countries that, in fact, you often have an increase in public trust initially because you have a much stronger shared uh, understanding of values and so forth. So your informal structures are extremely strong. And actually, that means that trust levels can be done without a regulatory framework. So a lot of... Um, in terms of the private sector, a lot of decision making and deals will be made on basis of handshakes rather than within a strong legal um, document that you might have in other countries. So you have high trust, but low regulation, and that can actually be quite a, a challenge. No, and that you're absolutely right. And of course, accountability is easier because it is personal. You yes. know the person who made that decision. You know the person who has that job. Um, so yes, it is. It is just different. Thank you. Great. Um, we've got a few more questions that just come in. So uh, one person said the principles and values are also adopted in my context, though only on paper rather than in the heart and minds of the public servants. What should be the critical thing that should be done here for people to practically demonstrate these principles? Uh, I would love to hear if there are examples. Thank you. Um. It's a kind of a combination approach, uh, you know, on, too much focus is often made on doing, as you've said, the on paper this exists, but we don't necessarily have to live it. So there's two things. One is a strong level of education, um, so you're actually spending time engaging with people. The other is making that fact public so that there is an understanding in the larger society that this is taking place. And then the third, I think, is about that responsiveness uh, point that came up out of the OCD. And so responsiveness doesn't have to be the formal regulatory environment. So if there is a bad thing done, this is what actually happens. Responsiveness just is about being very clear about the channels that you can engage with government about. So there was a really interesting example in Indonesia in the last 12 months where they used a, a mobile app to do two things, one of which was to sort of improve, understand, knowledge, literacy about public services, but the other was to be able to um, report any wrongdoing or issues with COVID funding and response. And, you know, it was a very quick, simple way of getting out there, but it actually, it almost doesn't matter how many people bothered to engage with that app. It's the fact that they did a big public campaign for that and made very clear to people, if there is a problem, this is where you go. So we want to hear about what's taking place. 
The other thing is they didn't just have it as a reporting thing. They had a very clear timeline for how they're going to respond because often that what happens is that you go and make a complaint and nothing takes place. So you're, you're demotivated and you don't bother to do it again. So I would say that, you know, it's a multi-pronged approach, but really the key thing is showing publicly that you're open to receiving in, um, information response connections with the, the larger society. And that when there is something that's taken place, and um, if there is any wrongdoing that's taken place, that actually action is taken quickly and people know what to expect. And if the outcome is, well, actually, I'm gonna take pick on Neil here, but Neil, someone's complained about Neil as a public servant, um, and actually there is no wrongdoing. I don't just say, yeah, Neil's fine. You know, he's a good guy. I worked with him for 20 years. It's no big deal. I actually say, well, this was the complaint. This is the investigation. And this is why the decision was made not to fire Neil. Um, because often it's just a matter of explaining to people you know, how the decisions were made. Is that, I know, no, Neil, is that? <laughs> it's so yeah. hard to do this dialogue without seeing whether or not this is answering you. Know, please feel free to ask follow-ups if that I'm not yes, answering please do. properly. <laughs> yeah, please do. I mean, I think that um, uh, if, if you attend any, uh, as we hope you will in the future, uh, events in which Tanya and I work together, you'll find that I usually end up being the butt of Tanya's examples and stories, all of which I want to make clear are fictitious and um, just for the point of purpose of illustration. I think that um, you are asking about what can be done. I think it's a good, it can be helpful to look at um, corrupt behavior, inappropriate behavior in terms of the relationship between cost, risk, and advantage. Why do people pay a bribe for a service which, um, in principle at least, they have a right to as part of having paid their taxes? Um, it is because the advantage that they will get outweighs by far the cost of the bribe and the risk of any penalty falling upon them for doing so is also seen as very little um, or you know, non, non-existent. So on the one side, you have cost and risk. If the cost of a corrupt act is low and the risk of suffering any penalty is low and the potential advantage you're going to get from that is high, in any society, you will have more um, inappropriate behavior in the public sector. When that starts to change by exactly the kind of things that Tanya is, has described, and the advantage that you can gain is seen as disproportionately low compared to the cost you're gonna have to pay to get it, and the risk of some penalty falling upon you if you're caught, um, then it will change. Uh, it requires more than one person to change this um, in a society. And so we have all seen, um, maybe in our own countries, certainly on news reports of other countries, leaders coming in with a strong position against corruption. As Tanya said, corruption, the comparison uh, with cancer is a good one because corruption is not a single thing. It is incredibly complex and it is far, far easier to prevent than to eradicate once it exists um, because there are a whole lot of people who um, are committed to the continuation of the system once it's created. So what can be done is to start with some changes and accountability and confidence, exactly as Tanya described with the Indonesia example, are a key part of that, I think. Thank you. And do please ask follow up or make a point or, or disagree by all means. Great. Uh, we've got another question that's just come through. Um, so thank you for your presentations, which were excellent. It is my opinion that these matters are more difficult in small developing countries where when office politicians have so much power. Sometimes when some matters arise, they can be seen, they can be seen as solutionist problems. I, I think 
I completely understand that. Uh, I'm not sure that they are necessarily, I mean, I would argue that when you are in a, a richly resourced environment, the temptation for things to go wrong are actually quite high. Um, so it, it's not so much that the, they're solutionless. I think what it is, is that we have that sense of an inherited network of informal connections that seem very, very difficult to challenge. And I do understand that. And that is much more evident in small under-resourced countries. However, when I moved from Canada to the United Kingdom, I was stunned at what I perceived as the level of nepotism and incredible connection, simply because I was a new person to the country. And yes, there were 60 million people in the UK when I moved here versus 30 million in Canada. However, you know, of that 60 million, the governing class has basically gone to two universities and more or less within the same time frame and belong to the same clubs and, and went to the same sort of primary schools. So, uh, you know, yes, we are a larger population with a lot more money in the UK potentially, but I would argue that the us versus them political class divide is as strong in the UK as it is in smaller nations. And um, sorry, Neil, did you want to say something on that? No, I, 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 I'm trying to think if there's anything I can add other than to echo what you've said. Um, I, I think it's, it is a very sad thing to think of a solutionless problem. And um, the last thing we would want to do is to be simplistic or glib about um, how things can be improved. Um, and in some environments in which we've worked, um, corruption uh, and these sorts of problems are so ingrained that anybody tackling them uh, risks more than their professional reputation. Uh, and so we need to be realistic about what can be done. Um, we also, going back to something that Tanya mentioned right at the start about engaging with civil society and others, it's it's good to be clear about what really matters to people because that's what is most likely to change or to change first. And we have, we, people who do our kind of work, um, have always assumed that you could almost put um, an economic rating on, on how serious an act of corruption is, i.e. by definition, um, the Minister of Defence um, taking um, a bribe uh, of $500 million to give a certain contractor um, a contract, by definition, must be more serious than um, a doctor uh, requiring um, a $10 payment um, before medicines are provided. That's actually often not the case because people understandably care more about what touches upon them than whether um, a Swedish company, a French company, a German company or a British company actually has got the contract to provide um, aircraft that no one is ever going to see anyway. Um, so what matters to people is where if solutions are going to come that's where the solutions are going to come first. And to understand what those things are, what really matters. Is it the fact that teachers don't turn up in the classroom um, rather than, um, as I've said, politicians receiving vast amounts of money for oil contracts? What really matters? What do people really care about? Thank you. And just to say on that, I think one of the things that's been most interesting over the last 12 months is that you would think that we would all be so overwhelmed by the health crisis taking place that you know we wouldn't necessarily want to be as engaged um, in public life. But actually, global surveys have indicated that there has been a significant increase in the number of reported wrongdoings. And yes, that may be because there is more wrongdoing, but I would also argue it's because people actually care. You know, people do want to make the world better, and you know, maybe it's just more obvious because it's been related to the provision of health services, but I actually find that really encouraging. 
I think it's something like a 40% increase globally in reported wrongdoing, which sounds bad, but it's the fact that people are reporting that's the strength, not the fact that there's a 40% increase in wrongdoing. Okay, um, so this is again another comment rather than a question, but they said, when a public officer speaks up, the officer's career can be stalled. I recommend Dr. Ruby's Ruby Brown's book, Professional Hurt, where she describes what happens to public officers in the Caribbean who speak up. Okay. Book recommendation. Yeah. Thank you. Did you just really mention the name of the book and uh, author again, please? It's yeah, Ruby. So it's, yeah, sorry, Tanya. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> it's, it's called Dr. Ruby Brown, um, and the book's called Professional Hurt. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think just to say that on that there is a, a real push uh, to try and address the issue of whistleblowing and public disclosure generally and this is one area where i think unfortunately legislation has far exceeded actual successful implementation uh, there's a lot of public disclosure and whistleblowing acts uh, around the world the actual protections in place are pretty minimal unfortunately uh, cases are there are not many successful cases of people being protected and that is a huge problem i would say um so yes i think you know the reason that people don't report wrongdoing are multiple but one of them is the fact you know there are some very significant personal implications leaving aside the fact that in some countries it could actually lead to harm to self or family there's in most jurisdictions everywhere in the world there is professional repercussions, no matter what the protections say. And again, I would argue that this is the reason that we try to have multiple mechanisms for responsiveness and engagement, rather than having to go immediately down a formal route of complaint and whistleblowing. And the more that we can encourage dialogue, the better. Thank you. I think we're coming to the close of this session and you have given us, uh, Tanya and Neil, a, a lot of food for thought. And um, I just want to say that um, uh, Tanya has worked with us uh, on a project in Liberia with the Liberian Anti-Corruption Commission through UNDP. And um, and there have been other projects that Neil and Tanya have worked on with governments and um, at different levels from providing training, doing consultancies uh, to identify the problem and um, doing investigations. So uh, they have uh, a lot of experience and examples uh, from different parts of the world and today's session was to give food for thought. But if you uh, think that it would be useful to explore what could be done in your context, um, we've also um, have had training on public service values induction programs. What does it mean in action? Public service, public sector values. What does code of conduct mean? Um, all of these are um, trainings that we have developed and um, devised for different public sector governments in different locations around the world. So uh, I just want to say thank you very much for your time and attention today. Um, and uh, thank you to Neil and Tanya for uh, sharing your knowledge and expertise. I hope uh, a great deal of food for thought has been given and perhaps um, um, if you would like more information um, that please feel free to contact me. Um, you will be receiving a thank you note and my email is in it, uh, Christine Tokar at doddsgroup.com. And if you have other resources like what has been shared, um, Professional Hurt, for example, the book uh, by Dr. Ruby Brown, please feel free to share those kinds of resources as well.
So I want to say thank you again to all of you for taking the time to attend. Um, I didn't introduce May, but I want to thank May for uh, being the organizer in the background. So uh, thank you to all and uh, thank you again. And we hope to have more questions, comments, uh, if you want to explore uh, ideas or what can be done. Uh, we would be happy to help you. Okay, so thank you all. Um, any final comments, uh, Neil and Tanya? No? No, just to add our thanks and uh, wish everyone safe uh, and good health and thanks for your time. Okay, thanks very much. Bye now. Goodbye. Bye.